Good morning. Yeah, this mic is definitely working. Good morning. So glad to uh, see you all here. We're starting up now on uh, Sunday School Live uh, for today. So glad to have you all here in person um, and online. I know we're getting a started a bit later than we usually do, but that is uh, typically what happens for us on first Sunday when we have uh, Holy Communion served and many more people here in the sanctuary and, uh, and also with this being the beginning of uh, Black History Month. Speaking of uh, Black History Month, I usually introduce myself as uh, Ralph Gordon, but uh, since I'm wearing my uh, dashiki from Ghana, I will reintroduce myself as Yao Nunya, the name I was given uh, when my wife and I were blessed to be there in West Africa back home. So uh, it was a blessing. Uh, there is a story behind this dashiki and how I came to acquire it. But uh, if you hang in there with me, perhaps I'll share that with you at the end of the lesson. Um, it's, uh, it's a story. But uh, welcome you all here so much, Mom and Dad. Glad to have you with us. It was wonderful to spend time with you uh, recently uh, in your home. So, so glad to have you. Uh, shout out to my brother Rob. I know you're down under now and having a marvelous time with your daughter and granddaughter. So, uh, please give Kara and Riley a hug from us. Shout out, of course, to the Pattersons. You might be in Chicago this week. My brother Glenn in Houston, uh, just back from a trip like we made out on the uh, Caribbean. Sister Jean Robertson, we're praying for your recovery, um, and uh, we'll be seeing you uh, soon. Likewise with you, uh, Sister Shirley, Shirley Burton, uh, blessings to you, and my dear sister, Berta Bryant, still carrying uh, your, your card of encouragement and greetings uh, with us, and hopefully uh, we have the tilleries on and I'll be in touch with you folks soon. But moving forward, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this divine time to study from your word. We thank you for the gift of your word and how it uh, blesses us and guides us and leads us and particularly instructs us, educates us, and motivates us in terms of being better servants for you. We pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us in this lesson and direct us. I personally pray that you will give me the strength to do what you need me to do. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Oh Lord, you are my strength and you through your son are my redeemer. It's in the name of your Son, Christ Jesus, whom we pray. Amen. So it's good to be back with you. It's been a while uh, since we've been here, and the Lord has uh, blessed us to go and come. But as uh, that wise uh, young lady said, uh, there's no place like home. So always good uh, to be back with you. We're moving forward in the uh, curriculum put forward to us by Urban Ministries Incorporated, you and I, and uh, right now we are moving through the prophets. And we've talked, we spent time with the major prophets, um, Isaiah and uh, Ezekiel and Daniel. Who did I leave out? Jeremiah. I got to leave Jeremiah out. He wrote the book uh, that is named for him, the eponymous naming of that book, and also Lamentations. And then we moved into the, uh, what are called the minor prophets. Now we know we call them minor prophets, not because they are less important, 
but because their writings are shorter. Last week, uh, my, my partner, my very sharp partner, Brother Michael McCants, talked to you about uh, the book and the writing of Joel, uh, that prophet. And we'll tie a little bit of that into uh, this lesson as well. Next week, I'll be back before you to talk about another one of the minor prophets, Obadiah. So we'll be going through a number of those writings. Um, you know, every time we talk about giving, you usually hear in the giving events, this is from Malachi, another one of them. But there's also Micah and Nahum and Zephaniah. So there are a number of these prophets. And in the Hebrew Bible, all of them are in one book. They call it the Book of the Twelve. So when we um, read from some of the theologians, and I'll be mentioning one of them shortly, they refer to them as the Twelve. So there are 12 minor prophets. And if we're looking at this from a numerological perspective in the Bible, we see that the number 12 has a significant meaning in terms of completion. Uh, how many disciples were there? 12. Even when one of them committed that heinous sin of betraying Jesus, Judah did that and left them with 11. Well, what did they do? They went and made sure that they went through a prayerful process of replacing him and um, went back to 12. How many tribes were there? There were 12, right, Reverend Barbara? We, we can walk through this in terms of numerology and underscore the importance uh, organizationally of completion for the number 12. We can look at the number seven from, uh, you know, from completing certain things. How, how many days did God uh, create uh, the world and all? So, you know, I don't want to digress too much, but I did want to uh, reference uh, the numerology and the importance of numbers. So here we have 12, again, being very important in that we have these 12 uh, supposedly minor prophets that we have. So if we can look at our cover slide as we look at uh, this uh, prophet that we talk about today, we are talking about Amos, Amos, A-M-O-S, not to be confused with Amos, A-M-O-Z, uh, I think the father of Isaiah. But here we're talking about Amos, and we'll talk a little bit about him. And as you can see, we just have a few verses here. And the title of our lesson is, God is not fooled. God is not fooled. You know, a number of folks think that they can fool God, but then they have to learn the hard way. The hard way. If we can come off that slide for a moment. I mean, our Bible starts off with somebody trying to fool God. Cain, where is your brother? Right? And what did Cain say? Hey, am I my brother's keeper? And you know my three-part statement, the audacity, temerity, and stupidity of Cain to think that he could fool God. He had already slain his brother. He had already killed him. But he said, hey, am I my brother's keeper? Now, you know God knew that he had done it. So we have to be careful in our lives thinking that we can fool God. Sometimes we spend so much time fooling each other and uh, fooling, thinking that we can fool God. But we need to be honest with ourselves. Did not William Shakespeare say it through Polonius as he spoke to Laertes? To thine own self be true, and it must follow as the night the day. Thou canst not then be false to any man. So let's not think that we can fool God. So we'll move back from Shakespeare. Come on, Brother Ralph. Deal with some scripture stuff here. Second slide. <coughs> I'm so grateful to our uh, AV team here. They're just phenomenal. On our second slide, we have a couple of questions for you. 
And you know, we always give you questions to ponder. I think Brother Michael does this uh, as well. You know, and uh, sometimes we fool, I think we can fool God with our religious practices. So I just throw out the question, <clears throat> you know, you ever been a part of a religious ceremony or service that didn't appear to be genuine? You kind of felt something wasn't there. And you can say, well, how would I, you know, be in tune with yourself. Be in tune with yourself because sometimes you can feel, you know. I, um, I feel particularly blessed you know, have a pretty good sense of direction. And sometimes even GPS will be wrong. You know that, right? You know, the global positioning, you need to follow the God's positioning system. But, you know, sometimes I'll say, wait a minute, it just doesn't feel right. And if it doesn't feel right, I'll stop. My wife will tell you, I'll stop the car and uh, recalibrate. So sometimes something looks like it's something, but, you know, you wonder. You know, you, <laughs> you might go to one of those healing services and people hitting on the head and falling out and all that. And, you know, ask yourself, how genuine is that really? See, because when it's real, you don't need prompts. You know, if you were in the uh, worship service here at Allen Temple today, you know what's real. You know what I mean? The Holy Spirit was just running all over this place, smacking us all upside the head. You know, you didn't need any artificial stuff because it was show sure enough genuine. Folks were hollering and screaming and, you know, the choir was singing and folks were clapping you know, all y'all really needed after that was Dorothy May Gordon, my mother, to come in here with her tambourine, and that might have finished it off for you. So, <laughs> you know, but it was it was real. It was real. But if you've seen something tonight, how did you respond? Just ponder something for you to think about, something to be considering. You know, my grandmother used to sing the song, real, real. Jesus is real to me. Oh, yeah. He gave me the victory. All right. Slide number three. Because I can feel the Holy Spirit running through me right now when I talk about my mother and grandmother. Y'all know I'm a boy from Philly. My sister Barbara and my homegirl out here. But, uh, you know, with those two southern women in my life, mother from North Carolina and grandmother from Georgia, I, uh, I got something else going on here. So what's, what are our objectives? We want to understand this prophecy um, from Amos. We want to understand it, his role as well, and his speaking to these two kingdoms. And we'll get into a little bit about why there are two kingdoms. You know, we just think very often about the kingdom of Israel and, you know, all the people Israelites, but there was a split. So we'll touch on that a bit. And we want to understand, too, the situation, how it compares to our society now. Deacon Olin Grant, our beloved deacon here, you know, in addition to him saying, you know, you know, uh, other things, he often tells us, here you go, Reverend Barbara, he says that the exegesis is not complete until the application is made. So Reverend Robert Wilkins would tell you, yeah, you got to understand, first of all, the beginning of it, the origin of it. But, um, you know, then, uh, you know, now we then move to, to an application. So we'll do an exegetical study and then move forward. Slide four, you know my process, those of you who have been with me before, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So I'm staying with it. Thank you, Brother Ken Roberts, for your encouragement on this. We'll go through bibliography first. So you can uh, just uh, be with me in terms of the reference material that I've used um, with the time that I put in to study, to prepare, to come before you. I don't just come up here with, here's what I think. You know, I want to go and I look at my scripture I read that, and then I consult theologians, ministers, writers, others to gain some further insight. So we'll do that. We always do POI, 
points of information. So I've got that, Brother Rob, uh, for the Prophet Amos. Next slide, uh, we'll do context, text, and of course we'll do uh, remember these things as we uh, close out. So if we skip ahead to bibliography slide, oh, you folks are already there. But let's hit the first one first on slide 23. Um, we've got uh, commentary and, and look at J. Vernon McGee, um, noted theologian. And some folks, somebody told me this week, they said, yeah, I remember what you said about him. Theologically, great. Politically, not so much. So I have to parse the word with J. Vernon McGee. But theologically, he has good stuff. All the men in the Bible, Herbert Lockyer is such an expert um, in terms of giving us profiles of individuals. Uh, on that next slide, 24, yeah, we have a, a very detailed commentary. Walvoord and Zuck, these guys, they have one on uh, the Old Testament, one on the New Testament. Both of them are profound uh, in terms of the volume of information. Dictionary of Biblical Imagery recommended to us by a Reverend Dr. Brenda Guess as she stood here, Chancellor of the, uh, Allen, the Institute, Learning Institute at Allen Temple. Um, another very heavy, valuable volume on my third page of uh, bibliography. On the next slide, we uh, the Holman Handbook, and but the dictionary itself. Um, you know, I remember early going in school, you know, if you wanted to do something, you looked it up. You got Webster's, didn't you? That was what you looked up. If you went further, if you wanted to know a comparison of words, you looked at the thesaurus by Roger. Okay, but um, I think we all knew that you go to Webster's Dictionary, you'd be talking to God and saying, yeah, you know, well, Webster's said, the only thing with Webster's, though, you had to be able to spell. You know, it's not like you go on dictionary.com or something now and it gets, helps you. So Webster, you had not as well, but you look stuff up. So be that as it may, from a dictionary standpoint, Holman's uh, hands down, uh, tremendously valuable. Holy Imagination, you've heard me talk about Reverend Dr. Judy Frentress Williams, and she's the one I was alluding to who in her writings does not in, have individual chapters on the minor prophets. She talks about the 12. And then when you read that chapter, then within that, she gives you clips about each one of those uh, individual um, prophets. Phenomenal writing in her book, Holy Imagination. On the next slide, Life Application Study Bible. Everybody should have a study Bible. MacArthur's good. I always have, and I forgot to put it in my, uh, my briefcase today uh, from our own highly esteemed Pastor Emeritus Reverend Dr. G. Alfred Smith, Sr., New Treasures from the Old, that small book that just has a ton of good information therein. Final slide on bibliography, Precepts, the UMI, that's the Sunday school book that we're presently using. Uh, Pastor Tony Evans gives us a lot. And even the Daily Bread. You know, I get the Daily Bread online now, but I went ahead and ordered their Understanding the Bible Old Testament, and they have some nice pieces uh, in that book as well. So if we go back to slide six, we jump right into the POI uh, of uh, the points of information for Amos. And we may not be as familiar with him as we are others. You know, we, we know about Isaiah. You know, in the year the King Uzziah died, you know, we know about Jeremiah. You know, we call him the weeping prophet, you know, and all of that. And you know, and uh, oh, don't forget, you know, Ezekiel saw a wheel way up in the middle of the air. You know, we know about Daniel, you know, and the lions then and all that. But then when you get to the minor prophets, you know, it's, you know, we, we, we might have a little more to study about and uh, to learn. But we should because uh, they played a very important role for us, not only in terms of biblical history, but in terms of what they did and what they said and the words that they left for us. So here we have a guy, Amos, and he himself, when you read in there, he called, I'm just a common, I'm just a common man. I, 
didn't go and have, I didn't go to seminary like you or Reverend Barbara. I'm just a regular guy, but the Lord called me. You know, actually, I was just a shepherd. I was just out here with the animals, you know what I mean? And uh, yeah, I did a little stuff with some trees and big trees and all that too. So he tells you, I've given some verses here uh, about him uh, in terms of him telling you what his occupation was, what his vocation was, uh, what he was doing. And it's from a town called Tekoa. And Tekoa is about 10 miles south of Jerusalem. So uh, he wasn't from the holy city, okay, but he was from this, uh, this place uh, called Tekoa. I'll show you who his contemporaries were. You see, you know, he was there, you know, during the time of Jonah. And, and Jonah's coming up. Hosea, I think we've already passed. But, uh, and of course, Isaiah, the mighty one. Um, but uh, when did uh, Amos prophesy? We know he tells us. You know, he prophesied during the days of a couple of kings, uh, Jeroboam uh, the second in Israel, and then Uzziah. Uh, and remember, Isaiah gives reference to that, doesn't he? Sixth chapter of Isaiah begins in the year that King Uzziah died. So, um, well, while he was alive, that was when uh, Amos I was preaching, and I said about the two kingdoms. Kingdoms were joined together as one kingdom of Israel. But, uh, you know, after Solomon and then his son, and, you know, just a mess, the kingdoms split. Ten tribes went with the north. That remained Israel, but Judah, uh, two tribes uh, in the south. Now, Tekoa, interestingly, is in Judah. That's where it was. So Amos was from the southern kingdom. But God sent him to talk to these folks up north because they really needed some talking to. So we're going to delve a bit more. You won't see it all on the slide. I couldn't put all of this on the slides. But uh, we're going to talk a good bit more about these two kingdoms and what the issues were uh, between them. So if we look at the next slide, seven, um, so, well, this is what I just said to you. I forgot I, I did put this on the slide. So although he was a native, uh, native of the southern kingdom, he prophesied primarily in and to the northern kingdom of Israel. But you don't know where the Lord might send you. Send you. you just don't know. Uh, you know, I'm a guy who grew up in, in Philadelphia at a church called Holy Temple. Holy Temple, Kojic Church. And now here I am in Oakland, you know, at a church called Allen Temple. You don't know. You don't know. So following the directives of the Lord, you know, he had to declare judgment on these people because they were hypocritical. They were hypocritical, uh, not only in their worship, which we'll get into, but also their treatment of the poor. They were exploiting the poor. They were taking advantage of them financially and also in a, in a legal way, exploiting them in the court. I mean, look at us today. You know, if you got money, hey, you got it made in the legal system, don't you? You can have delay, delay, delay. You can have a prosecutor coming after you, and rather than dealing with the, uh, you know, the actual issues, you can say, yeah, but she's having an affair with her colleague. And then you can do all kinds of stuff when you got money. But if you po, you're lucky if they give you a, a public defender. And you can imagine, you know, that, that drop off, not just so much that they are bad lawyers, but they got a lot of cases. They don't have the resources they on their money. So, you know, as we talk about comparing, you know, what was happening then to what's happening now, to me, is easy. We don't have to wait and think about it. So the, the, this exploitation and harsh treatment of the poor was something. And if you think that we're making that up, we can come off the slide a minute on this, folks, because look at it today. You know, we all come to church. We all dress real nice. You know, try going into some churches in your blue jeans, you know what I mean, in your dirty clothes or whatever, and see how you will be treated. Notice I say going to a church. I didn't say going to someplace else, you know, go in there, not dressed consistently with how they think you should be dressed. Oh, I've seen it in Allen Temple. You know, we used to have homeless people 
who would come to our Sunday school class, we can come off the slide for a moment, you know, in class five. And they would come in, and we'd be so glad to have them. And they would only come to Sunday school. They wouldn't come. I'm not trying to just extol the virtues of class five here. Jackie, Sister Trailer, or y'all remember, they would sit in the back. They would put, and we would pass the envelope around for, uh, it just hurts my heart. We pass the envelope around for you to contribute to the Sunday school department. You know, people put a dollar, two dollars in. They would put pennies in, nickels, you know. But bless their heart. They gave what they had. And we don't need to go into Jesus' teachings, you know, about, you know, whose, whose gift has more value. But they felt comfortable because they were not judged. We just have to watch ourselves in terms of how we deal with folks who may be less fortunate than we. Because I think somebody said, there but for the grace of God, go we. Yeah, we go to the Safeway, we go to grocery outlet, we're putting stuff in that, in that, that grocery cart. You know, somebody else is carrying their personal belongings in that grocery cart. You know, you getting up this morning trying to figure out, you know, what you're going to put on. As I often say, somebody else didn't have that problem. Because whatever they had slept in last night is what they're wearing today. You trying to find the umbrella, they're trying to cover themselves in a cardboard box. So we just really need to understand. And then we have the audacity to walk past them and not even speak. You don't necessarily have to give them something sometimes. How about giving them acknowledgement? So, you know, we can look at this, what Amos was talking to these people about, but we need to examine ourselves. The Bible tells us that that is what we are supposed to do. Okay? So back on the slides, slide eight. So Amos had a message. Hey, y'all. Um, this is why, and this is how the Lord's going to punish you. Okay? He was there. He was, you know, this is what, a prophet does. And this is something I learned from sitting at the feet of the preeminent Reverend Robert Wilkins. You know, we think of prophecy, you know, as, oh, yo, yeah, here's what's going to happen tomorrow. No, you know, not a fortune teller. It's not a Ouija board with a prophet. A prophet speaks of the past and of the present and of the future for God. The qualification is, is the prophet speaking for God? delivering a message, okay? So, you know, Amos had told them, hey, this, y'all, y'all been messing up. You know, you have been doing badly. And as a matter of fact, you're still doing badly uh, in terms of your worship, particularly. We'll talk some more about that. And here's how God is going to punish you. This is what is coming. Thank you for coming, brother. Thank you so much. God bless you. So these are the messages that Amos had uh, for the people. And feel free to stop me at any point if you have a question or a comment, please. This is not a soliloquy. So Amos predicted that the people would go into captivity. This is what's going to happen, y'all. And we'll see that particularly in the final verse of the lesson text. And matter of fact, I'm not even going to just tell you about you going into captivity. I'm going to tell you where you're going to go in general. Okay? So what do we have? Context, slide nine. Uh, the book of Amos, we can't go through all the chapters uh, in detail. We don't have that kind of time. But just to set it up for you um, is that the book begins with Amos, in addition to introducing himself, but he's given his declarations of judgment and punishment about the, na- about the other nations. So when you read that first chapter of Amos and then going into the second, he's saying what all the stuff he's going to do to the enemies of the people. Now, you know they were feeling good about that. Oh, this is great. You know, God's going to take care of, you know, all our enemies around us. This is real good. But that ain't all he talked about. (laughs) You know, while you're celebrating the punishment of your neighbors, look at slide 10. Then he went into, uh, you know, in these uh, second and third chapters, Oh, by the way, y'all, <laughs> y'all been messing up, and punishment is coming for you too. 
okay? Because you've been disobedient. You know, you folks in Israel and you folks uh, in Judah. So here, here's what's coming. So where's our lesson? We're in the fifth chapter, okay? Our lesson, right? So on slide 11, as we, you know, we see that the people are called to repent. You know, and it kills me sometimes. People want to talk about forgiveness, but haven't even repented. Haven't even admitted what you've done wrong. And Lord, please, you know, how about that? You know, that thief on the cross, he knew he didn't have much time. <laughs> you know, you know, and what did he do? First of all, he acknowledged his sin. His buddy was busting on Jesus, and he told his buddy, you need to shut up. We're the ones who need to be hanging here because we're the ones who committed the crime. We are the thieves, you know what I mean? So, uh, and then he looked and said, Lord, please remember me in your kingdom. And, uh, you know, I always like to uh, play with that conversation, you know, because what did Jesus say? Did Jesus say, oh, you know, how long have you been a member? Okay, Reverend Phil, you've been here 27 years. Okay, Brother Ralph, you've been here going on 29 years. No. <laughs> did Jesus say, uh, were you a deacon or a trustee? What's your title? You know, no. Did he say, did you go to seminary? God bless you, Reverend. But, I mean, you know, did he ask for all that? No. He said, this day thou shalt be with me in paradise. Okay? Because he had repented. So Amos had that message calling to God's people for repentance. Then, as we see, the text speaks regarding the day of the Lord. You know, and we have confusion about that. You know, last week, uh, Brother Michael McCann did a superb job from the book of Joel talking a bit about the day of the Lord. But some folks think, oh, that's going to be great. You know, when we all get to, when we all see, you know, hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. The day of the Lord is a day of judgment. Day of judgment. So be careful what you ask for. As a matter of fact, that's one of my main messages for you today. Be careful for what you ask for. I remember talking to somebody here, and we knew a, somebody else who was really doing some horrible things. And the lady said to me, well, maybe he's waiting for God to speak to him. and Maybe he'll change. And I said, he really doesn't want God to have to speak to him. <laughs> you know, think about it. I'm going to do wrong until the Lord tells me to stop. I don't recommend that, okay? <laughs> you better wake up yourself, you know, because when the Lord speaks to you, it might be too late. Okay, back on slide 13. Advice from Brother Amos, Shepherd Amos, you know, Farmer Amos, do what is good and run from evil. Now, that do what is good. We could just stop right there, couldn't we? Hey, Sp what did Spike Lee tell you? Do the right thing. T-H-A-N-G. Oh, no, he spelled it thing. Okay. Do the right thing. I slip into the vernacular from time to time. Do what is good. Run from evil. If you want to live, hey, you know, you really want to live? This is it. Then the Lord God of heaven's armies will be your helper. Just if, you know, you've been claiming this. You've been saying, oh, we're the, we're the particular people. We're the special folks and all of this. Well, then, um, you know, do what's right, you know. You are to hate evil and love what is good. The message here, you know, don't be condoning it. Don't be going along with it. Don't be trying to explain it away. You ought to hate evil and love what is good. You know, because one of the things the devil does, he'll sugarcoat stuff, do all kinds of things, and we'll find ourselves going along with it and thinking that it is okay. You got to watch it, you know. Let's come off the slide for a second, you know, because there's a certain governor in the state of Florida that uh, I'd like to deliver a message to. 
hey, dude, we didn't benefit from slavery by gaining skills, okay? We did not benefit from slavery by learning some skills. We had skills when we were brought to America from Africa. We already had skills. And what we suffered here was abuse, family disruptions, name changes, beatings, killings, you know. So don't try to sugarcoat and make something that was evil into something that was good because it was horrific. Your people didn't suffer that. I look sometime at Mexicans and I see them and couples and the kids and very family oriented and the father and the mother be walking with them and I'm happy for them. I am happy for them. But I understand part of the difference. They didn't suffer the same that we suffered. They didn't go through family disruptions, you know? I said, my name is Ralph Gordon, yeah, because that was my father and grandfather's name and all that, you know? But would that really have been my name if I was still on the continent? That's why we had to go back and get some names and get some more culture, you know? So we've suffered differently. But don't try to sugarcoat bad things. And don't go along with people who, that's a message for you, Tim Scott, don't go along with people who, you know, do badly. I'm not here to make a political speech, but I'm just saying in this politicized America, we need to be clear, you know? Who do they talk about now politically? evangelicals. Well, I thought I was an evangelical. I come to Allen Temple and Pastor Smith and folks tell me, you know, we're supposed to follow the Great Commission. Matthew 28, 20, you know. So I thought I was an evangelical. But these folks, wait a minute. You know? And what do they always do? I just read an article yesterday. Said anytime they say evangelical, they think that that's somebody white. They don't think it's you, you know. When they say working class folk, they think that's something. They don't think we work, you know. Some guy accused me of getting special. I said, listen, anything I got, I work for. Anything my dad got, he worked for. Anything my dad's dad got. I had to get him straight. Like we all here just beneficiaries of the largesse of the government. Give me a break. You know, when they said go back to Africa, I said, well, maybe, but you know, I'm staying here because my ancestors worked for free. You know, we ought to despise evil. And that is what Amos is saying. So when we look back at this slide number 13, folks, what do we see? Hate evil. Love what is good. Turn your courts into true halls of justice. Because it's not true now, you know. And, you know, folks with the money get to really get the justice. As somebody said for us, it's just us, you know. It's hard for us to get justice, you know, when you don't have the resources, you know. O.J. got something because he had some money, and he got Johnny Cochran. <laughs> but that is not the usual case for the rest of us. We don't get Johnny Cochran, <laughs> you know. We do the best that we can, you know. So turn the court's. So Amos is being very specific here in terms of what sins. He says, perhaps even yet, Lord God will have mercy on the remnant of his people. God always is going to have a remnant. You know, everybody's not going into exile. Everybody's not going to be punished. You know, there's going to be salvation for a few. Oh, we have scriptural, biblical precedent. Yeah, we all know what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah, but think about what happened before the destruction of those sinful cities. Somebody said, well, you can't negotiate with God. I heard somebody said that once here. I said, that's not true. There are people who have negotiated. Abraham was negotiating with God. 
What if we can find 100? What if we can find 50? Abraham was bartering, trying to negotiate with God that everybody wouldn't be destroyed. And everybody wasn't. There was a man named Lot, right? Abraham's nephew, who was able to get out before the destruction with his family. But I know you biblical students and scholars know one person didn't make it, Lot's wife. Why? They were told, don't look back. And sister girl turned around and she became Morton Salt. She became a pillar of salt. So that was unfortunate. But the key thing is that a few were saved. Okay? As it says in James 5 and 16, the effective prayers of a righteous man availeth much. So Abraham prayed and got them out. How about Noah and the ark? God was destroying the earth, right? <coughs> with floods. Yeah, but he let Noah get out with his family. Oh, yeah, by the way, Noah, I need something for you to do with the animals, you know. But uh, so a remnant was spared, as I said, precedent for us. Okay, moving forward in this lesson text, and we can skip to slide 15. What do we got? So here's where we have the be careful what you ask for kind of thing, I think. What sorrow awaits you? Those of you who say, <coughs> excuse me, if only the day of the Lord were here. Because people regarded the day of the Lord, oh, that's going to be a holiday time, you know. But forgetting the fact that there's a good news, bad news element, because it's the day of judgment, okay? So it's going to be good for some folk, but for some other folk, it's going to be not so good. And then look at, look at Amos, you know, the man who works for animals and those animals so well. Well, you might think it's okay, you know, because a lion is chasing you, and you run from the lion. This is in the Bible. This is verse 19 of the fifth chapter of Amos. You run from the lion and you get away, and then you run into a bear. You know, Pastor Smith Sr. always said, I wish I could make it play. Amos is making it play. Yeah, you got away from the lion, now you done run into a bear. Think about it. You thought you got away. Day of the Lord, no. You know? So then he says, yes, you know, the day of the Lord is going to be dark and hopeless. You know, for some of y'all, there's not going to be any joy. There's not going to be any hope. Because you have been sinning, sinning, sinning against God. You've been worshiping pagan gods. You've been exploiting the poor. You've been carrying out injustice. So you want to pay for that. So don't think that the day of the Lord is going to be day of the Lord is going to be some wonderful time for you. Now, look at this on slide 17. And notice this is in quotation marks. So Amos here is quoting, see, we've got a little difference here, uh, Reverend Barbara. We ain't just doing prophesying, speaking, you know, from God. We're saying this is what God actually said, y'all. You know, I hate your show and pretense. I know that y'all were faking. I know that you were putting on airs. Let's come off the slide for a moment because maybe y'all haven't heard that saying in a while, putting on airs. When I grew up, that was what you heard. I used to say in class five what I had heard, which was, how do you define a hypocrite? A hypocrite is someone who is not himself or herself on Sunday. On Sunday. It's easy to come in here. Oh, I feel the Holy Spirit. I feel God in here. God bless you, sister. How you doing? Hey, my brother, God bless you. How are you? It's easy to come in here and feel holy and act holy. See? But tomorrow, when I bump into you in Grocery Outlet, tomorrow, 
when you drive in front of my car, <laughs> you know, how am I going to act then? See? Tomorrow, even though you heard about these people in bereavement, these families, which one did you call? Which one did you text? Which one did you send a card to? Today's society will tell you, oh, don't send no card. You can just email them. I hear people saying that. You know, Hallmark needs to pay me because I believe in sending cards and signing them with my hand, not with a stamp, and writing a message in them, doing something personal because I don't think that being personal is ever obsolete. So I don't care what society tells me. But, you know, I can't mail them on Sunday. I got to mail them during the week. So who are you during the week? And, you know, as somebody said once, who are you fooling? Because you sure ain't fooling God. We think we can fool each other. Love you. You know, I almost hate it when people say that. You know, it's just like, do they really mean it? Love you. You know, who are you fooling? You know, how you been doing? Well, I'm blessed and highly favored. Sounds real cute, doesn't it? Cliche. But do you really feel that? See? What gets me is that when we have the offering, you know the doxology after the offering. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Well, do you really believe you're praising God for all? Because you're just praising God for the offering. You know, and I'm saying that when you almost had an accident with your car on 880, you know what I mean? I'm saying that when that bus was right there, and you almost missed it, but you caught it. You know, I'm saying when you thought, oh, my Lord, I don't know if I can pay this bill, but something happened and made it possible for you to pay it just in the nick of time. I'm saying you need to be singing praise God from whom all blessings flow right then. Don't be saving it for no other time. And when you say you're blessed and highly favored, it ought to be for something. Not that I'm just blessed and highly favored. Well, why are you highly favored? Give me an example of that. Y'all know, I get up here and testify. I told you about the time when there was a railing here for an offering. And I was in here on my knees praying. And there was nobody else in the sanctuary but me. And I was praying to the Lord to help me because I was getting ready to walk into a very difficult situation. And it was on a Saturday. It wasn't on a Sunday. This is years ago. And I told you that when I ended my prayer and when I said amen, my cell phone rang with help. Hey, don't tell me about no human coincidence. That was divine providence. And I knew I was highly favored in that moment, which is why I'm telling you now. Oh, you need another example. I came to church one Sunday years and years ago, sat up here where the minister sit, sat there, and I was just feeling really down having a really bad day, church ended. I didn't move. I just sat there, sat there. Somebody came and put their hand on my shoulder and just kept it there on my shoulder to bless me. Didn't have to say a word until I regained my strength. And I thank Reverend, no, I said Reverend, I thank Deacon T. Wayne Coleman for being that person at that time. I was highly favored by that brother, he who trains deacons, but I'm telling you, his own life. So he and I, when we see each other, he kind of remembers something I did for him. No, you know, here's a parallel for you to the Beatitudes. Blessed are those who don't remember what they give, but never forget what they receive. So I'm here to tell you about what was done for me, not for what I did. But he and I have a bond, and we look at each other, and our code word is always. And we'll always be there for each other. That's what we do. So that's about, isn't this something about keeping it real? Don't we like to say that? Yeah, let's keep it real. You know, let's keep it real, you know. But a lot of times the words from the street are words that we really should internalize and practice. And isn't that what Amos is telling them? All that phony stuff y'all doing. You know, you're going to pray to pagan gods, but pretend like you pray, you know, you go into the Lord. 
you know, the scripture says here, and let's take a quick peek at 17 again, folks, on the slide, I will not accept your burnt offerings and grain offerings. So what God is saying is, here y'all come with these sacrifices, and they're not real. Okay, you see it on the slide? Got to come off the slide again. Let's come off the slide. So this looks like, oh, God is being harsh. You know, is that, what, why does God do? You know, well, if he knows it's not for real, he doesn't want it. God told King Saul, the king that the people wanted so badly, we want us a human king. We don't want to be under a theocracy under you anymore. We want a human. Okay, they got Saul. God told Saul to go slay the enemies of the people, the Amalekites. Kill them all, get rid of all their stuff. What did Saul do? Saul killed some of them and kept some of the best material for himself and his guys. Didn't obey God. You know? Samuel the prophet and the judge came to Saul and said, what in the world have you done? You didn't obey God. What did Saul say? Saul said, oh, but it's all right, because we took some of that and we made a sacrifice to God. <laughs> you know, so like that makes it okay. And what did Samuel say to Saul? Obedience is better than sacrifice. You all know that. So that's the story behind that verse. You know, you see that in 1 Samuel. So obedience is better than sacrifice. So God didn't want your phony sacrifice because you weren't really sacrificing to God. What you were really doing is just trying to placate and pretend and, you know, justify your disobedience. So Amos is telling the people, you know, you've been doing this. Matter of fact, it ain't even for real. You know, it's not even for real. So God doesn't want it. Perfect example of uh, God's rejection of uh, the so-called offering or sacrifice. Slide 18, here we go. Matter of fact, God said, I don't even want to hear your songs because God is angry. <laughs> I made a note. Where did I make the note? I said, this is primarily a lesson of chastisement. Because <laughs> God is really upset with y'all at this point. I don't want your offerings. I don't want your hymns. I don't want to hear your music. I don't want to hear nothing. Because you're not for real. So keep it. Sorry, this is what Amos is saying that he got from the Lord. Matter of fact, what does the Lord say? Instead of that, Here's what I would like to see. Give me a mighty flood of justice. Oh, give me an endless river of righteous living. Oh, what does it say in the King James? But let justice flow like water and righteousness like an unfailing stream. Does that sound familiar? It ought to sound familiar. On August 28, 1963, in the city of Washington, D.C., the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. gave what I feel is the, the greatest speech ever. And in the middle of that speech, MLK quoted this. And go back and listen to it, because you will hear him say it. Let justice flow down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. So you have King quoting this, Dr. King quoting this in his I Have a Dream speech. So just something uh, to behold for us in terms of the elevation uh, of Amos. And you know, and this also too, this... Um, refusal of God to accept these hymns and false worship. When you go into the 5th, 6th, and 7th chapters 
of the gospel according to Matthew. The Sermon on the Mount by Jesus. You know, we know he gave us as a part of that, what we call the Lord's Prayer. It's really a prayer of teaching the disciples. Jesus' prayer is in John 17. But in the midst of this Sermon on the Mount, you know, we got this, you know, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. But before that, Jesus says, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, which is in secret. And when thou hast shut the door, pray to the Father who already knows the things you have. You know, and he, but in that too, he also says, and we can come off the slide here a minute, because I'm talking about Jesus. And that's whom I hope you would see. Through me, Jesus said, when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. For they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. It's in your Bible. <laughs> it's in the, you know, this is like a preamble to the Lord's Prayer. So, do you know, these folks are, you know, Jesus, 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 Jesus. You ain't got to do all that. You can say it once. Lord, remember me in your kingdom. Oh, Peter saw Jesus walking on the water, didn't he? Peter said, can I do that? <laughs> you know, Peter, he was the impetuous one. Jesus said, yeah, come on. Come to me, come on. And Peter was walking on the water, just like Jesus told him he could. Looking at Jesus. Then he messed up because he looked down, <laughs> took his eyes off Jesus, and what did he do? Y'all know, Peter started to sink. Now, then he said a prayer. Did he say, Jesus, 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 Jesus? Did he give a long prayer? No. He gave a three-word prayer. Lord, because he knew who he was addressing. Save, he knew what he wanted done. Me. And this is who it's for. <laughs> and in that instant, he was right there with Jesus. So you ain't got to do vain repetitions. If you want to do that, fine. But understand, don't think that you're going to be heard anymore. Some folks say, well, I can't pray like so. I, yes, you can. Whatever your prayer is, whatever your way of praying is, Lord, why not imitate Peter? Lord, save me. Lord, help me. Go into the vernacular, Lord, help me. Huh? Keep it simple. You know, when I, in my career, we used to say the KISS method, K-I-S-S. -S. Keep it simple, stupid. I mean, why not? You know, you ain't got to preach your prayer. Keep it simple. But, of course, let it be real. Let it be real. Back on the lesson text as we try to wrap this up. Thank you all for your patience. Amos says, wait a minute. And this is God. Notice the quotes. So the Lord is still speaking. Who were you bringing them sacrifices to? Were you bringing those to me? You know, we're on slide 20. You know, oh, during your 40 years in the wilderness, you all remember that, right? And we're going back to Moses now. The Exodus. You know, come on, Israel. What were y'all doing? Because I know y'all had a golden calf. Was that for me? I don't think so. No. no. You were serving your pagan gods. Okay? Sakath and Kaiwan. Matter of fact, you were dealing with astrology. <laughs> your star god. All of this was going on at that particular time, you know? You made images for yourselves, you know, like the golden calf and all of that. It's very interesting. Stephen's name, excuse me, Freudian slip. Amos's name is not mentioned elsewhere in the Bible. Yet and still, Stephen, our first Christian martyr, in the seventh chapter of Acts, quotes Amos. That's what he does. Okay? 
So wrap it up, Brother Ralph. Slide 21. Okay. Here's what's going to happen, y'all. You've been messing up. I'm going to send you into exile. And guess where? It's going to be east of Damascus. We know Damascus today, right? Still, it's the capital of Syria, all right? So he's letting you know, you know, here's where I'm going to be sending y'all. I decided to plop a couple of maps into the lesson this week. Let's take a quick look at slide number 28. Slide 28. may be hard for you to see, but if you look on the left where the Mediterranean Sea is, Damascus is not far from the Mediterranean Sea. But as you move further east, you see in bold Assyria. So your northern kingdom of Israel, they were overtaken by Assyria. And they were exiled to Assyria and even further than that because they were heavily dispersed by the Assyrians. Now, what happened to the people of Judah? Well, on slide 29, a similar view I have for you. Again, Damascus being to the west, to your left on the map. Okay, but where was the Babylonian Empire? We see that in bold. Also further east, not only with Babylonian Empire, but as I said, I know it's small and I apologize uh, for not magnifying it for you, but to the east. So we know about the people being taken uh, to uh, Babylon. Okay, so if we go back on slide 21, thank you folks upstairs, we say that final verse of the text here that uh, Amos is telling them, guess what? You're going to be sent to the east of Damascus. Uh, that's where you're going to go. That's going to, what's going to happen. But there is good news. You already saw that there would be a remnant which, who would be saved. You already saw that uh, the Lord says he's going to provide that salvation and a restoration. Yeah, you people in Judah, you're going to have a 70-year exile with Babylon, but at the end of that, you're going to come out of that. Isaiah, Jeremiah, the other prophets all talked about it. So what do we need to do? Slide 22, what do we need to remember? Let's keep it real in our worship and service for the Lord. What pleases the Lord? When we are genuine in what we do for him. And we also could say when we are genuine, not only in what we do, but when we listen to him, when we listen to his Holy Spirit. Let's come off the slide and let's hear what Yao Nunya has to say about why he is wearing this dashiki today. Many of you know, and thank you for hanging in. If you want to leave now, you can. I, I share this with you just to share the story. We were in Ghana this year, this past year, and we were touring they call them slave castles. They're really fortresses where our people were kept before they were sent here. And it was very humid at the time in June in Ghana. So um, we were touring this, and I was wearing a nice shirt and long sleeve because you want to wear long sleeves to keep the mosquitoes and all that off of you. And we had to go through a lot. At any rate, my shirt became soaking wet. So my lovely wife said, you know, honey, you need to, you know, dispense with that. So there was a little bizarre kind of thing when they were selling different things. Saw this dashiki and said, hmm, I like that one, and purchased it. 
Well, thought that might be the end of the story. So, but I hadn't put it on. I just purchased it, carrying it in a bag. So we walked back to our tour bus and wanted to get her on the bus, got her on the bus. Then I got off the bus carrying my bag with this dashiki, still wearing my soaked shirt, which was wet with sweat and all of that. Went to a men's room nearby and changed. Well, there was a gathering around our bus. You know, you're on the bus, a lot of people trying to sell you stuff, and, you know, and all of that. So they're all watching all this. So I come back out of the men's room, and I'm wearing this now, and I'm carrying a bag with my perspiration-soaked shirt, you know? So as I'm walking through the crowd to get on the bus, a young man named Thomas says, give me your shirt, give me your shirt. I'm thinking like, he cannot be serious. You know, this perspiration, filthy shirt is in the bag. So I went and got on the bus. He came and to the door of the bus and said it again. He said, give me your shirt. It will change my life. You know, what was I to do? Oh, no, this is my shirt. I paid a lot of money for this shirt. You know, I got more than one shirt at home, you know. But I was also thinking this shirt is dirty. It needs to go in the laundry, you know, and all this. But he said it will change my life. I apologize to you because I have photos. And I'll share them with those of you who are here. I took the shirt out of the bag and handed it to him. I thought he would just take the shirt. He put the shirt on immediately. And had this proud look on his face. I handed my phone to my wife. I said, you got to take my picture with Thomas. So in that picture, in West Africa, you see me with my arm around Thomas. And, you know, and he's grinning. And all his friends are gathering and saying, wow, you know. But, and the people in the body, oh, you gave him the shirt off your back. But I didn't see it that way. I saw it as a test from the Lord. You know, you stand up here on Sunday morning in Allen Temple Sanctuary yeah, you so holy. Yeah, you teaching the Bible. You know, you talking about how we should treat folk. Uh, what you know? What would you do, Brother Ralph? In the moment, if I had come back to California and not given him my shirt, I would feel horrible. You might think I blessed him, but he blessed me because I left a part of myself in Africa and I brought a part of Africa with me. So I am the one who is blessed. And I thank the Lord and the Holy Spirit for guiding me in that moment. That is why I share the story with you. You wanna be a blessing, you will get a blessing. So Yao Nunya. He who was born on a Thursday, he who might have some sense, thanks you for listening. Heavenly Father, thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. 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 Thank you for this day. Thank you for this opportunity to share. Thank you for these wonderful people here in the sanctuary. Thank you for these wonderful people online. Thank you for their faithfulness. Thank you for their love of you and your word. 
Thank you for loving us. Thank you for blessing us. Blessing us here in East Oakland. Blessing us in the motherland. Thank you. Help us to listen to your prophets. To listen to Amos and all the others you've sent to speak to us and for us. Please bless those wonderful servants. Deacon T. Wayne Coleman, Brother Thomas in Ghana. Thank you. Bless them. Keep them. Stay with us, Lord. Please keep us in your care. It's in the name of your Son, Christ Jesus, who gave his life for us that we pray. Amen.